Shinobi, and we are bringing you Black Digest episode 270 at block height 684,937 on Tuesday, May 25th. What is up? Hello, hello. Good week not to read Twitter. Yes, let's all stop reading Twitter. Can't do it. Someone's busy being wrong on the internet somewhere. I gotta find him. I gotta find him. Also, stop reading price charts. Can't do that either. So I have, like, completely missed the major price moves in the last couple of several days or whatever. Uh, I always find out afterwards that it did something. I have not paid attention. I haven't even looked at the Bitcoin price in about a month. If you don't observe them, they didn't happen. It's very easy. Just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. But but it, it went up, right, guys? It, it, it goes up forever, right? Only up, no down? It went, it went up, and it went down, and it went up again, and then it went down again. No, no, no. And then no dips I think allowed. it went up. No dips allowed. Uh-uh. It's not allowed. Verboten. What goes up must come down. I don't know. I, I sold all my coins and moved to Bermuda, so I'm glad my internet's good over here. Alrighty, though. Ball busting of price and kitties aside. Shall we get on with it? Mm-hmm. Well... I guess you're up first with uh, one of the few positive-ish pieces of news today. Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen and punks, uh, Taproot activation is upon us because as reported by Andrew Chow on May 24th yesterday, uh, the BTC.com mining pool began issuing work that signals Taproot on all of their stratum servers, uh, which means that we have now been pushed up to the 95 threshold necessary for lock-in uh, possibly within the next signaling period miners if you fuck around during the next period I swear to fucking god we're going to prove this state I'm pulling Ethereum mm. right on your ass yeah with all the other bullshit though it would be very nice to have that lock-in and not have to worry about that anymore do you think they're going to strategically time it for the conference in the hellhole known as Miami? Ah, uh, we'll find out. I don't think we'd get through the next period without a, uh, a lot of new hash rate coming on by the time Miami's done. Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't know. That very well could time out that way. All right. Be ready for the first big piece of drama. Oh god, the billionaires are fighting again. Mm -hmm. So, after Elon's giant meltdown last week over the carbon emissions of Bitcoin mining, hmm, hmm, he suggests auditing miners to see how much of their electricity is renewable. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Where does where does this go from here? Oh, the mining council. We Argo Blockchain, Blockcap, Core Scientific, Galaxy Digital, Hive Blockchain, Hut Eight, Marathon, and Riot Blockchain. Um, they all formed a group to discuss how to make 
Bitcoin mining, ESG compliant, green energy. Do public disclosures of how much green energy they have running their operations and encourage other miners to do the same thing. Hmm, hmm. Could be, could be really nice, except, um, yeah, um, how did this go last time we had these closed door meetings with this kind of shit? Hmm. Wasn't it a bunch of people who arrogantly decided that they spoke on behalf of Bitcoin, knew what's best for Bitcoin? Oh, yeah, and Elon pushed for this. This is all about humoring Elon. Hmm. Doesn't his car company, Tesla, make all of its money off of carbon credits? And he's, he's sitting here bitching about um, the carbon emissions of miners? Hmm. Let's find this one particular quote. This was really interesting. Um, so Coindesk specifically asked one of the uh, members of this council about carbon credits. He declined to speak on the council's behalf. <clears throat> so in other words, the issue of carbon credits for mining totally fucking came up in this. And yeah, um, th th this is just fuck these people. Stop circle jerking any rich person that comes into this space and goes, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Because you're legitimizing them as an expert when they're really mostly just clowns who don't understand what the hell they're talking about. And shit like this happens. Now, is this going to kill the Bitcoin network tomorrow? No. Is this a good thing? No. This is the type of slippery slope that just goes right down the hill towards the jaws of regulators and bam, you're a nice meal for them. This absolutely is going to go further and further down the direction of what you, you don't have green mining operations. Okay. Maybe we're going to tax you a little more. You're going to have to buy, um, you know, carbon credits from somebody. Oh, what you, you want, you want to start a mining operation that isn't green energy. Sorry, not allowed. And w when that type of regulation starts creeping into miners in North America, when, when they literally open this door themselves, you think it's going to stop there? Oh yeah. Marathon mining, the OFAC compliant mining pool is, is one of the people involved in this. Hmm. Hmm. This, this seems great. Yeah. That like, th this is two X all over again, except people are literally going, yay, because now the media will stop saying that we make carbon mining Bitcoin. Like really? We're, we're going to cheer on this type of regulation of one of the bedrock pieces of this network, because the media says Bitcoin mining bad for the environment. Like what the fuck happened to this space? I think that's a good sniff in terms of why Elon is interested. He has made a lot of money selling carbon credits. So I hear, so uh, makes absolutely perfect sense that you would want to corner this section of the market. Mm hmm. And it's like, think about how you can plug like Tesla, like um, the, the ARC paper um, that Square collaborated with on using mining um, as well as batteries to kind of arb um, like electricity on the edge of the grid. Um, hmm. What does Tesla make besides cars? Oh, batteries. And fires. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I, I don't care how much ass kissing and rationalizing and bullshit goes through the media in this space. Like, this is a horrible fucking idea. And this is absolutely going to start sliding in that direction. I think these guys are definitely interested in this idea of having an, an energy reporting regime. Uh, it helps them from the current narrative point of view in terms of all that matters about doing stuff is related to carbon and they're producing a worthless good that only has a carbon footprint that isn't compared with say polluting aspects of other economies or whether that energy was going to get burned on something else, etc. So I can see why they want to do this from a PR point of view. Uh, I can see how it would be good for their share price. 
uh, I get why they want to get together and, you know, maybe the carbon credits explain why Elon's interested. So I, I appreciate that they want to go fight some FUD, but the centralization in general, that's, that could be trouble. Mm -hmm. And fun times too, because, uh, guess what Marathon's doing? They just signed a deal with, uh, Compute North in Texas to pretty much provide a bridge loan to them um, to build out a um, data center for a mining operation with up to 300 uh, megawatt capacity. Um, yeah. So that at the end of, and this will probably take a year or two, um, the deployment for everything, um, they're supposed to have around 10 um, exahash of miners deployed here um, with 70% air quote carbon neutral power. Um, really? Hmm. I, I'd really like to get into the magic technology that, you know, builds solar panels and batteries and shit without all kinds of toxic mining and shit with slave labor. Um, but yeah, so they're massively expanding in Texas. Um, again, part of this mining council, the OFAC compliant mining pool. So yeah, um, to anyone out there who doesn't think that that council is a big potential issue, um, let's play a game. Let's pretend for a minute that hash rate is actually leaving China. I don't believe it is based on the disruption we saw in Xinjiang. Um, but let's pretend it is. Um, so where's it going to go? Here, North America? Okay, so all the hash rate shifts from China to like North America and Europe and shit. And um, oh, this mining council thing. Um, they expand, their hash rate share gets bigger. Does does this seem like a, a concern troll? Or or an actual potential issue to think about? Anybody who's interested in the carbon footprint of various types of energy resources. On the Brink just did an episode with Hass McCook, who has been looking into this for a long time, and I'd, I'd recommend that for some overview. Yeah, like there is almost no industry on Earth that has deeper renewable energy penetration than Bitcoin. Yep, and it's straight up incentives. Uh, even renewables are not quote-unquote carbon neutral. It takes carbon to make solar cells. It takes pollution to make solar cells. It takes carbon to build the steel for windmills. It even takes carbon to build hydroelectric power. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Yep. I want to see the math on solar panel shit when you take into account the Chinese coal factories making the solar panels. That, that'd be fun. Yeah, and you've got a account for industrial byproducts that go into all these things too. So now yeah, we're not in a unidimensional carbon only world, which is very interesting that we kind of got there right at the same time and would like some carbon credits, please. So question why the narrative got to where it got. But dude, nothing matters but carbon. Dude, it's totally environmentally friendly to have little African slave children, you know, digging toxic lithium and shit out of the ground so we can make renewable batteries, dude. There's no carbon. It's all good. Yeah, or processing one ton of rock to get a couple grams of gold. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I guess next up um, in the little mining chunk. Uh, so pretty much China is... Um, very obsessed right now with uh, deploying monetary policy tools in order to keep the economy stable after the giant shit show last year. And um, Bitcoin mining um, was kind of offhand mentioned in um, an announcement regarding, you know, maintaining that stability, blah, blah, blah. And um, in response to this, um, Hoibi, um, the exchange also runs a mining pool. Um, and also ran um, minor co-location facilities in China, um, is shutting down all their co-location facilities. Um, not, not the mining pool, 
just the uh, the actual hardware hosting services because of that announcement. So, um, yeah, maybe the next time we see a big power disruption in China, we will get a glimpse into whether the meme of Chinese hash rate migration is actually going anywhere or it's just a meme. Go loco. No. Oh. I think you're up with the last little mining update. Oh, yeah, I got this one. All right. Good old BlockFi starts uh, mining with Blockstream. So, in, uh, in an environment where you don't get paid to issue shares of GBTC anymore, our best buddy U.S. crypto lender, interest provider, etc., BlockFi, has said that they are partnering with Blockstream to set up a mining operation in Georgia, USA, uh, that also has access to 300 megawatts of power capacity. Uh, it's interesting to me. I, it seems like I see 300 megawatts on everything. I don't know what's special about 300 megawatts, but people love it. Uh, so keep doing it. So this kind of smells of BlockFi being able to uh, reliably offer Bitcoin interest into the future. Uh, I believe I've heard numbers like with the newest high-end hardware, it costs around $20,000 to mine a Bitcoin at this point. Uh, which is pretty good relative to Bitcoin price. So it sounds like they have decided to diversify how they will have new Bitcoin coming in and have partnered with Blockstream to do so, which has been a pretty, uh, I don't know, commonly played move lately. I believe Galaxy Digital also partnered with Blockstream, as did Acre out of where? Norway. Switzerland, I think. I so, think. Yeah, so Europe for sure on that one. So anyway, Blockstream is definitely winning up this uh, mining partnership alley. Uh, evidently, they, they seem to be reliable to the market to manage their mining infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, from a technical point of view, this is just one more of those things that I don't like seeing in the mining ecosystem, you're opening the door to regulatory capture and influence and centralization. But that said, this is really interesting from the financial point of view. Well, I know you and me have had this conversation quite a lot about um, like Bitcoin yield um, going forward into the real long term. And, you know, just that that idea that if, if we wind up seeing, you know, mining become a nation state type thing, that very well could become the only viable way to do something like a bond denominated in Bitcoin with, with a, enough risk mitigation. And even though it's not a country, this isn't a bond, yada, yada, it's still interesting to see the abstract dynamic actually kind of coming to play now they have a whole business built around generating yield on bitcoin and where are they going after their last cash cow gbtc you know is is all fucked up right now they're going to mining and i just think despite all the centralization risks here that is just really fascinating from the financial side of things yep it's it's definitely interesting to see BlockFi go there. Uh, it seems like a natural place for them to go for yield. Uh, you know, they have a giant consumer business, so I imagine that could eat all of their coin income by itself. Uh, we'll have to see where it goes with the bonds, with Blockstream mining notes already on the table. Uh, we've got another Blockstream story here in a minute that's up this alley that is more like them taking a step towards where BlockFi's at. So it's, it's interesting to see these integrated or these companies starting to kind of integrate different features of, of Bitcoin access together to offer more complex products. Mm -hmm. 
So speaking of BlockFi, we got another one up there, Allie. So BlockFi was offering an interest rate promo for the summer here. And uh, I don't have all the details on front of, in front of me, but basically they were, they were sick of getting killed by everybody else in the market on stablecoin rates. I believe they've offered 8.6% 8 8 .6 APY on stablecoins for a very long time now. So they had a promo open to offer another 1.4 on top of that to get up to a 10% rate, which is fairly standard right now across the industry as far as interest payments go. And uh, you could check uh, you could make new purchases or check stable coins into their platform and they were going to do a one-time payment of the enhanced rate after the end of the promo so they did said payment and evidently the first hundred or so people got a bonus usually blockfi pays out interest in the terms of whatever it is they're paying interest on so for btc they would pay btc ethereum ethereum stable coins in that stable coin in this case it sounds like instead of paying interest by default in the stable coin for the first hundred or so people that they paid out interest in they got it all in btc and they didn't just get it in BTC at the US dollar rate that one would have expected from holding the stable coin. They got it in raw numerical value in BTC. So if you had a dollar in interest coming to you, you would have gotten one BTC in interest. So evidently about 100 people got paid out like so and saw that hit their accounts. Uh, there were definitely pictures going around Twitter of payouts to the tune of 700 and 1200 BTC amongst others. And supposedly some people managed to get some of that off platform before BlockFi noticed that they were taking it off platform. So there was definitely a failure in auditing here to uh, assure that what was getting paid out was paid out in the proper terms, which is very interesting to watch. And then it also feels like there's a failure in auditing of somebody actually taking such a gross amount of funds off the platform, which I'm sure just went through the regular auditing steps. But if somebody got hundreds of BTC off platform that they had earned an interest the day before, I would kind of have expected typical auditing steps to catch that. And they haven't been really clear on how they ultimately did catch it. Maybe it was somebody trying to take stuff off platform that did it. Uh, but that's the news. Now I'm disappointed I didn't check in stable coins during interest because, you know, this is a new industry. You should be, uh, you should be trying to figure out where the potential holes are. <laughs> yeah, but like, ah, man. Looks horrible for accounting practices for them. Obviously, not good PR. I'm just thinking the engineering side, like, holy fuck. Like, <laughs> how did that happen? Yeah. And also, I, I, keep in mind in the future, it could go the opposite. They could pay out too little. That is much easier of to course. fix, though. Well, it's all easy to fix as long as it's only in your database, right? As soon as stuff gets off platform, you have to get lawyers involved and send threatening letters and that sort of thing. So that's trouble. As far as how it happened, I assume there's a drop down somewhere where you set what sort of units you want to pay out and maybe it defaults somewhere that isn't to I have to wonder if that default to BTC and it burn them. Well, somebody's working overtime. Uh, the fun of being a Bitcoin bank. I can't wait till JPM and co host their own crypto services and they get to go through the uh, trial by fire. <laughs> that would suck for whoever got burned, but maybe that would be a good thing um, to get people not trusting uh, banks with their Bitcoin. Still doesn't make me want to join. 
All right, are we ready for something that I don't really care about? Let's go. So, uh, Crypto Graffiti has partnered with Blockstream to build out Rare Toshi, a uh, NFT trading platform built on top of Liquid that uses atomic swaps um, to structure auctions, bids, just normal purchases for uh, NFTs. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it. I don't care. Sweet. Diversity of NFT markets. Woo! I mean, there's literally one benefit here. Um, fees are way cheaper than on Ethereum. But other than that, there's still NFTs. They're still fucking stupid until you do something useful like a Magic the Gathering game or something. All right. Much, much utility. Next up, though, um, sure you are happy about this um blockstream has acquired tour de meester's um hedge fund adamant capital and is going to be launching a new division of blockstream blockstream finance um to kind of go forward in the direction they did with the blockstream mining note and uh effectively try to offer services or financial products that allow Bitcoiners to um, generate Bitcoin denominated yield um, off of their Bitcoin. So, uh, yeah, uh, like you said, um, seems like they're trying to poke around um, at BlockFi's, maybe not exact business model, but at that type of yield generating business model. Yeah, some of this might be about opening up things to Americans. So, uh, BlockFi's mining note is not available to be purchased by Americans, though I think if if you had certain flavors of American companies, you may be able to invest in such thing. Um, and I think that has to do with how qualified investors are recognized around the world and the auditing that goes into certifying that somebody is qualified to invest in certain types of products. So the way they issued that note, it was through maybe somebody in Switzerland or one of the, the Ritchie countries over there. And you could go to that company that was issuing, they could certify that you were a legal holder of that, and then you could get involved with it. Um, we, we have all sorts of stipulations in the US that are quite similar. Um, Around that mining note, I definitely noticed Preston Pish uh, talking to Capreal Management that has a actively managed Bitcoin fund about whether they could act as a bridge to get U.S. people exposure to things like that Blockstream mining note. And I believe Adam Back got pulled into one of those conversations. So it's definitely been noted. There are certain types of products that have not been accessible to U.S. investors. And I suppose buying out a U.S. fund could be a step in that direction. Um, as a person interested in Bitcoin yield on Bitcoin, I have to be bullish this. And I, I appreciate anything that brings up access to U.S. participants to things like this. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. It's just like, I mean, you know how I feel about these products. You want to have at it, have at it, but understand the counterparty risk that you're exposing yourself to. I, I do hope, though, this actually starts driving more financial use for things like liquid. You know what I mean? Like it's really aside from our being between a lot of the smaller exchanges, like it just really has not picked up a lot of use for like the original finance trading stuff that it was developed for like if this could actually kind of spur things along faster in that direction i'd call that a win yeah vehicles like this can ultimately be used to build out things like bitcoin mining data centers where you put in a bitcoin now that bitcoin can go towards miners and fees along the way and ultimately you get a yield on that um I, I think this could help all, all sorts of aspects of the Bitcoin industry. Mm -hmm. 
All right, on to some uh, IRS slash Treasury news. Boo. Yeah, so as reported by Vice Media, on May 20th, the U.S. Treasury Department released a report titled The American Families Plan Tax Compliance Agenda, which sounds like it needs a grammar check, but Biden's proposed tax enforcement strategy would require intermediary businesses, custodians, uh, what have you, to uh, report to the IRS if they receive $10,000 worth or more in cryptocurrency. Which, to be honest, uh, I thought they were already doing this, but apparently not. Uh, so it says, for new information, uh, for a new information reporting regime to shed light on previously opaque income sources effectively, it is imperative to prevent business income from being shielded from reporting requirements. This is why the new Form 1099 reports would also be required from payment service providers so that businesses cannot shift out of traditional financial institutions to other kinds of platforms and avoid making their income visible to the IRS. Another concern is that an information reporting regime will shift taxpayers toward a greater use of cash, although information reporting may push some taxpayers to transact more in cash to avoid the reporting. It is unlikely that a st substantial share of the business tax gap will move to cash-based transactions. Businesses already have incentives to use cash as much as possible to avoid detection via bank statements obtained in an audit, but there are practical barriers such as security risks and the difficulty of spending large amounts of cash for certain transactions to expanding the use of cash without depositing it in a bank account. Within the context of the new financial accounting uh, or new financial account reporting regime, cryptocurrencies and crypto asset exchange accounts and payment service uh, accounts that accept crypt cryptocurrencies would be covered. Further, as with cash transactions, businesses that receive crypto assets with a fair market value of more than $10,000 would also be reported on. Although cryptocurrency is a small share of current business transactions, such comprehensive reporting is necessary to minimize the incentives and opportunity to shift income out of the new information reporting regime. Uh, and then Naraj from Coin Center provided some comments on this news, uh, which again is for the most part a nothing burger because it basically puts the same requirements that businesses already have for cash uh, for now with cryptocurrency. Uh, and he clarified that uh, still non-custodial services, peer-to-peer -peer transactions and decentralized exchanges are not included currently in these requirements. Um, so as usual, the IRS wants to suck up as much information as possible because why not? And this just uh, gives some consistency toward the, their sucking. Yeah, if this is all on a 1099 type basis, it doesn't matter if you pay me in silver dollars, if you pay me in cat food, if you pay me in anything, you have to recognize it in US dollars. And that's always been the law. So maybe they're just clarifying on that. Uh, you know, I heard this talked about in terms of exchange reporting on things like moving around more than $10,000 off of an exchange. And that sounded like it was just to put the exchanges into the same spot that banks are in. Mm -hmm. They want to know where your coins are because they're coming for them. All right. Ready for fun times in D.C.? Fun times. When are so, there ever fun times? When we get to laugh at things, so always. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, Senator Kirsten Cinema and Cynthia Loomis from Arizona and Wyoming have launched the um. Wow, hold on. Brain. Um, the Senate Financial Innovation Caucus, um, which is, of course, going to uh, start talking about regulating things, not chasing uh, money away, uh, lobbying on Bitcoin's behalf for sensible regulation. And um, yeah, I don't know. I know a bunch of people in this space probably think this is nice and exciting, but I am just burnt out at being excited by anything that touches regulations or bureaucracy like this. Because, um, yeah, no, no matter how excited Twitter gets, um, it usually winds up going south or nowhere. 
like attack things if you're going to attack them politically at the state level. Uh, the federal government is all kinds of fucked up right now. Yeah, there's probably a role for these people educating other people in the Senate, in the House, and that sort of thing, because a lot of them have no idea what's going on. So I can see that, but uh, these caucuses, it's just a fancy word for council. <laughs> I don't even see the potential of that, man. I mean, like Congress has had, I don't know how many competent people and experts testify before them, and um, they still don't learn shit. Yeah, well, you didn't buy Bitcoin the first time you heard about it either. I could have just mined it back then. <laughs> could have had that island. All right, and what is next up? Oh, yeah. So, um, little update on the Colonial Pipeline situation. Um, so, there obviously were um, shortages and shit, um, unlike I thought when we first covered this. But I think that was mostly just due to idiot hoarding behavior um, rather than supply issues that got too bad. But uh, the pipeline is back online and gas is flowing. Um, and uh, Colonial actually did pay a, uh, a ransom uh, to get everything unlocked. And even after paying the ransom and getting the decryption tool, it was so inefficient and slow that they actually in addition to that, started relying on their own backups to get systems online. Now, this is the funny part. This is the best part. None of the pipeline control systems were compromised at all. That was confirmed. It was their business and accounting systems. So the reason the pipeline got shut down had nothing to do with safety issues, anything controlling the flow of oil and gas being compromised. It was their accounting system was fucked up. So um, it would take them a while to sort out payments for anything flowing during that time period. So they just turned um, you know, the pipeline off and fucked up the entire East Coast in terms of fuel supply because, um, yeah, they didn't want to have a couple days of accounting shit to sort out later um, instead of just getting the money. So. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I think we speculated on this previously. That would have been a very interesting thing if they hadn't paid the ransom and gotten their systems back online. Because I don't think people in power would have put up with our accounting system is down and therefore we can't back society when we're one of the privileged class that pretty much society runs on. Maybe we'll find out next time. Yep. But it's just, it's just amazing. I mean, it's, it's not like they could, like any customer could get away with just not paying them afterwards. It's just a little headache to get the accounting sorted out. And instead of dealing with that, you fuck up an entire coast of this country. Great. Awesome. Fucking grease balls. All right, let's step back a couple. We got a story about the old Hong Kong. Oh, I just realized that I fucked up the ordering. I jumped past a few things. Um, so, yeah, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, apparently, Hong Kong um, lawmakers are considering slash planning to um, restrict Bitcoin markets to just millionaires. So, if you aren't already a millionaire, um, no Bitcoin for you. No buying, no trading, no selling. I'm sorry, you're not rich already, so clearly this isn't for you. Um, so that's fun. Yeah, to clarify really quickly, the uh, it specifically says that you have to have a portfolio that is worth a million dollars or more. So you don't have to have a million, for example, I don't know, whatever fiat currency in the bank, you have to have a portfolio that is worth that much. So... That is slightly less restrictive, but not really. Um, still really, really dumb and authoritarian. Well, it's I more restrictive 
yeah, than having a $1 million net worth. Because if that's true and it's only portfolios, for instance, at one point, Hong Kong had the most expensive real estate in the world. So if you owned your flat, you were probably a millionaire. Uh, if that doesn't count, it would be harder for you to get into that class. Now, I want to know, it does being a Mt. Gox millionaire count? I want to know, really want to know. Uh, the other thing they mention here is this excludes 93% of the city's population from gaining access to cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I don't know if it's, I don't know if, I didn't check if it is restricted to portfolios. Um, it just, it's not restricted to, you have to have a million dollars in the bank or something. Usually the way this is accounted for is via net worth, at least where I'm familiar with it. And I, I don't know anything specifically about Hong Kong. Yeah, I think it is just portfolios, in which case, yeah, that, that is just fucked. Like... <laughs> That's pretty ridiculous, right? Because that would imply you don't get access to stable coins, which are, you know, just functional dollar bills uh, on a blockchain because you don't have a million bucks in a portfolio somewhere. Mm -hmm. Dude, we like. America should have just started shipping fucking AR 15s in 2019. <laughs> just ship them over. Go for it, Hong Kong. It was interesting how quickly those stories just absolutely were not talked about in our media once China really decided they were done with the protest. What? You mean the coronavirus protest? <laughs> Evidently, the Uyghurs are still a problem now. All right. In similar, you must be rich news. Wells Fargo has decided they're going to keep up with the big boys, Goldman and JP Morgan, by offering already rich clients actively managed crypto products to pad their bottom lines and keep up with the Joneses. Not much for details here. All they're announcing is a forthcoming announcement, uh, which is pretty much what we've seen out of all the big banks this summer so far. Uh, personally, I expected Wells Fargo to be about the last one that we hear from, and uh, maybe it already is for the biggest of banks. I am here to announce that we shall announce our response to Bitcoin as soon as we figure out what to announce. Exactly. You should go work for them. I hear they pay well. Uh, I also hear they used to shut down Bitcoiners' bank accounts just for linking up to places like Coinbase, etc. So, uh, slow turn of the ship going on here. Unless I am mistaken, I do believe Wells Fargo was the initial correspondent bank that started refusing tether-related wires and literally instigated the entire giant shit show of years-long tether bullshit, too. Mm -hmm. They also gave us Kevin Pham. <laughs> Thanks, Wells Fargo. We'll see how many quarters it takes these uh, clowns to bring services online. Because they're certainly virtue signaling now. Does that mean next summer we get product? Does that mean later this year there's product? No idea. Or like Wells Fargo. Good idea, boys and girls. Stay safe. So what is going on in Europe, Jeannie? Well, uh, as of today, May 25th, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights found in the matter of Big Brother Watch and others versus the United Kingdom. Uh, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, Big Brother Watch is a British nonprofit civil liberties and privacy campaigning organization that uh, they found that unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 8 of the European Convention uh, regarding respect, uh, right to respect for private and family life communications, unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 8 in respect to the regime for obtaining communications data from communication service providers, and unanimously that there had been a violation of Article 10, freedom of expression concerning both the bulk intercep interception re regime and the regime for obtaining communications data from communication service providers. Uh, and for a 
kind of background of what was going on here. The case concerned complaints by journalists and human rights organizations in regard to three different surveillance surveillance regimes. One, the bulk interception of communications. Two, the receipt of intercept material from foreign governments and intelligence agencies. And three, the obtaining of communications data from communication service providers. At the relevant time, the regime for bulk interception and obtaining communications data from communication service providers had a statutory basis in the uh, oh-so-great Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act of 2000. This has since been replaced by the Investigatory Powers Act of 2016. Great stuff. Not really. The findings of the Grand Chamber relate solely to the provisions of the 2000 Act, which has been the legal framework in force at the time the events complained of had taken place. Uh, That is Snowden time. Uh, Having regard uh, to the bulk interception regime operated in the UK, the court identified the following deficiencies. Bulk interception had been authorized by the Secretary of State and not by a body independent of the executive. Oops. Categories of search terms defining the kinds of communications that would be liable for examination had not been included in the application for a warrant. Oops. Yeah, the UK also doesn't doesn't really kind of believe in warrants so much. Um, And the search term is linked to uh, an individual, that is to say specific identifiers such as email address. Uh, Email addresses have uh, not been subject uh, to prior internal authorization. The court also found that the bulk interception regime had breached Article 10 as it had not contained sufficient protections for confidential journalistic material. Uh, Unfortunately, um, among other parts of the ruling where they found no violation, they determined, for example, that the regime by which the UK could request intelligence from foreign governments and or intelligence agencies had... uh, sufficient safeguards in place to protect against abuse and to ensure that UK authorities uh, had not used such requests as a means of circumventing their duties under domestic law and the convention. Mm, Yes. Has anyone heard of the Five Eyes friends? No, probably not. Um, Bullshit. Uh, In a public statement, Big Brother Watch wrote uh, in regards to this decision that the judgment uh, confirms definitively that the UK's bulk interception practices were unlawful for decades, a finding that vindicates Snowden's whistleblowing, uh, which is relevant because documents provided by Mr. Snowden revealed that the UK intelligence agency GCHQ... um, was conducting population-scale interception, capturing the communications of millions of innocent people. The mass spying programs included Tempora, a bulk data store of all internet traffic, Karma Police, great name, a catalog including a web browsing profile for every visible user on the internet, and Black Hole, a repository of over one trillion events including internet histories, email and instant messenger records, search engine queries, and social media activity. Um... However, the campaign groups argued that the judgment did not go far enough in declaring the mass surveillance practices unlawful, pushing the case up to the Grand Chamber. And there's further summary in the blog post. I added it to the show notes. Yeah. Uh, UK um, getting uh, their ass handed to them just a little bit. The government knows when you masturbate. I just want to throw some color on top of this because I read it only a day or two ago. Uh, in one of the UK's COVID studies, they were studying the impacts of people taking the vaccine. And as part of the, the trial to get set up to be in the vaccine study, you had to give personally identifiable information, including your cell phone number. Uh, unbeknownst to the participants, the government after the fact tracked those cell phone numbers and compared the person's movement prior to getting the vaccine to their physical movements post getting the vaccine. Of course, in an anonymized way, they say, but without informing participants that they were going to be surveying their movement, they went ahead and did just that and found that post-vaccine people had a radius that was 200 meters wider than it was pre-vaccine. And that just came out the other day that they had violated people's privacy around that. So this seems to be something that uh, is taken very lightly in the UK. Well, we are talking about the country that requires a license to jerk off. 
Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say that your your joke literally about they know when you masturbate is true because they want you to identify yourself in order to yeah. Um I'm always confused by claims that um location data or location patterns or movement patterns can be anonymized because how? Like how exactly I would love to know how they do that because um it's it's a location and a pattern. It's very specific to a particular person. I don't know how you're doing that, but I'm all, all that I'm that sure I'm sure they mean is I'm that sure what on they the mean spreadsheet is, yeah. you're represented as a hash. Like yeah. your your specific address is not on the spreadsheet. That's all that means. Yeah, which is bullshit because I mean there's obvious things that you could determine from these patterns which is oh this person spends most of their time at this location it's probably where they live they go to this other location it's probably where they work and all you have to do is like look at people who work for the company and then you have where they live and work and it's not like not hard uh but yeah this is not anonymized uh this i i believe the proper term at best is de-identified but that's i wouldn't say even good enough because again location and movement is uh, should be considered that identifiable information given it's rather unique mm -hmm. really really working out with the the new speak dictionary lately it's for the social good people. Oh, Ray Fudd, what is up? Sounds like there is a new trend that has been highlighted by somebody who gave a $5 million donation uh, to University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton Business School, the other day. Uh, so uh, sounds like it was an anonymous donation. It was $500 worth of cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin specifically, and uh, yeah, quickly shrunk to $3 million during this week's market implosion, uh, but supposedly still sitting on the balance sheet of the school. Uh, I have not done any background research into what their policy is, but it sounds like they're hedging it, uh, which I assume would have to be with options uh, to keep its value constant. But they've got a policy over there that you can donate in cryptocurrency as long as it's at least $10,000 worth. Uh, why that particular minimum is required, not completely sure. Uh, and then the story goes on to note that Somebody who kicked this off gave some money back in the day to the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, $10,000 worth half a million dollars today. I see this as a future trend, I suppose. I'm kind of surprised it was an anonymous donation, considering that's quite a tax write-off that most people would want to capture. But I guess if you are a filthy motherfucking whale, maybe that's something you can just do out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But I, I think this has legs. This uh, is going to be something that we definitely see early investors do over time. I would love it if universities set up funds where you could donate to it and they were committed, say, not to selling the principal and to getting yield off of said principal and letting that fund their university operations for a fixed number of years so i could donate say a bitcoin to my alma mater and they were under a hundred years worth of contract to not sell it so i could ensure that that was going to get to value somewhere they could do something with it in terms of yield in the meantime and fund normal university operations but i think we'll see places get innovative with this going forward I mean, I think this would just be a, a thing alumni would do. I mean, like, if your school keeps harassing you for a donation, you're going to cave and do it. Fuck it. Buy some Bitcoin, give them that, and then just tell them shut up because if they hold on to it, it'll fucking appreciate way more. Yeah, I, what I think we want ultimately is those structures on the university side where they're committed to not selling the principal. Because when you give them dollars, 
sometimes that'll fund say a scholarship which means they'll get some yield on it somehow and they'll pay out the scholarship on an annual basis and it will stay funded because that initial capital is checked in somewhere uh, i would love to see the same structure for bitcoin you're you ready for something cool something super cool huh 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 Mew. Jonas Nick from Blockstream did a benchmark of MuSig2 Schnorr multi-signature. He got on a single machine a 1 million out of 1 million participant multi-sig to finish a signature in two minutes. Wow. A million keys, two minutes. Like this right here is fucking amazing. Like th there is so much other shit to work out for things like channel factories on top of lightning. But this right here guarantees that the base layer scales. You can do a million people signing a multi-sig in two minutes. Uh, then you can fucking do a thousand like that. So the 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 base blockchain scalability of of actually getting things signed for multi-party stuff like that in the fucking bag let alone what you could do with shit like taproot like um you know a big issue and it's just going to get bigger going forward if a like a company has bitcoin on their balance sheet if you're going to try and self-custody that how with who who holds the keys? Who does what? You can make that as big as you fucking want. Like, I mean, I don't know why you would, but you could literally make a multi-sig. Most companies don't employ more than like a few tens of thousands or a hundred thousand people. Have every single fucking person in your company be part of a multi-sig. That's possible now. Like the fucking, like, it, it, this is just awesome. I, I just like, let's get fucking Taproot and Schnorr turned on right now so people can start actually implementing music to uh multi-sig and different shit like holy fuck this is going to be amazing whoop, whoop. scale that shit and then something else cool so bitmax research has posted a uh, another update from calvin kim on the uh initial u tree xo implementation um and he's pretty much got a very very basic version of the um initial block download but out of order um implemented so if, if anyone doesn't remember u tree xo is pretty much just a way to um have a node create a UTXO set commitment and then just use that um, and the inclusion proofs for it to validate blocks so that a node could exist without having to keep the whole UTXO set. That introduces fun stuff like being able to sync and verify whole different parts of the blockchain out of order um, in parallel and then just make sure that all of the end pieces of those chunks match up at the end so you can do a parallel um initial verification of the blockchain this in a very naive implementation um is i think 128 minutes on a ryzen 3600 with 32 gigs of ram um for the uh utree xo implementation it's 175 minutes to do the um standard ibd with core all in a row and there are still a bunch of optimizations um that could bring that down to 107 minutes from 128 um, for the utree xo implementation and this is the coolest fucking thing about this whole whole thing um he is building out a coordinator daemon and the entire idea is because UtreeXO would let you um, validate chunks of the blockchain um, out of order in parallel, you can split that up between multiple machines. So like, let's say, um, I don't know, you are in the middle of a super poor part of Nigeria. Um, your family doesn't have computers. All you have is smartphones. 
all of those can link together and validate the initial blockchain and then make sure everybody winds up with what they need to keep running after that. You can actually split up among multiple machines the initial blockchain verification. So like, yeah, um, this is coming along fucking amazingly. And even though I'm not the biggest fan of using this um, as a general scaling sense or tool in the sense of like everybody can just run a U-Tree node because you have to keep those inclusion proofs to be able to, um, you know, make a transaction that other u -tree XO nodes can verify but like holy fuck just as a means for doing the initial block download and then going back to running without u -tree XO or utxo set commitment that like this will be one of the biggest fucking breakthroughs in terms of getting the initial chain downloaded in people's hands that that we've seen in fucking forever like this is awesome Autism speed, done. Speed, speed it up. But it's like, yeah, with all the dumb fucking shit with Sailor and Elon, like this, this is cool as fuck. This is actual substantial progress that isn't just memeing fucking headlines. Woo! Speaking of speed ups. Uh, yes, my favorite topic, cars, when I don't even drive any. Um, but yeah, on May 12th, Jack Maulers, who has been very busy building a circular Bitcoin economy in El Salvador recently, announced, On your marks, this year the greatest spectacle in racing and one of America's favorite pastimes will have a Bitcoin car. For the first time in history, an orange-spotted Bitcoin-covered engineering beast is going to race 500 miles in front of millions of people. I'd like to make this point very clear. This isn't the strike car, the Coinbase car, the Kraken car, etc. Why? Because fuck that. Nobody wants to cheer for that. This is the Bitcoin car. <laughs> um, so on May 30th, this coming Sunday, driver Ed Carpenter and his team will take to the track to race car number 21. Yes, 21, the Bitcoin car. In uh, statement continues in a world of potato chip and energy drink sponsors, Ed chose to race for human freedom, financial literacy, financial inclusivity, savings technology, and Bitcoin open source development. Uh, he writes further that this came about after he received an email from David Ravensburg, who is a friend of Ed Carpenter in mid-April this year, asking if he would be interested in a partnership uh, in which they would forgo all other sponsors to race a Bitcoin-themed car in the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500. Uh, and yeah, so Jack proposes to have 70 percent of all donations go towards funding open source bitcoin development and the other 30 percent uh to ensure the car is funded once we have obtained the necessary capital to fund the car the 30 percent will then be donated to local indianapolis charities such as the riley hospital for children um he says i urged ed and his team to give it some thought and sleep on it if he was on board i'd give it all i got ed called the next day and said i'm in um after the race, the 21 Bitcoin car will be shipped to Miami for the Bitcoin 2021 conference, where he will be announcing all of the Bitcoin open source funding efforts. And so if you're interested in donating to this, uh, there is more information in the article about where and how to do that. But apparently Bitcoin is going to be racing. And specifically, I think they said something about how it's going to be positioned next to uh, another car that is sponsored by a bank. So that is even more funny. Um, yes, the memes abound. Uh, lots of uh, cars uh, driving very quickly. Not something I want to do, but sound, sounds interesting if you're an American who is into cars. <laughs> I think they're just trying to take it to Doge. You know, it wasn't one of Doge's big stunts back in the day to sponsor an indie car somewhere. Mm -hmm. A NASCAR. Yeah, but they're too busy going to the moon with Daddy Musk or something. Oh no, oh. they're they're busy being praised by Jihan Wu right now for uh, implementing SegWit and CSV so they can have lightning. <laughs> just found that Interesting. Right Wait. 
So you're you're telling me that the the whole plan to like make faster lower fee transactions isn't going to work without a second layer? Who would have guessed? <laughs> the doge name is at hand. It's almost like they're five years behind Bitcoin development. Yeah, but their developers Six. are all dogs, so don't be speciesist. Ah, man. <laughs> Who let the doge out? All right, one last story at the wire. Bonus story for uh, fellow Mount Gox millionaires. Uh, I got an email today that says the good old Tokyo District Court has decided that the draft rehabilitation plan that was filed uh, last December, I believe, and uh, reviewed in February a couple times, is good enough to go out for a vote for various Mt. Gox creditors that may have a login and access to the website and all that stuff. Uh, so if you are amongst the few, the wealthy, the Mt. Gox millionaires, um, get out there, check your inboxes, and uh, review that rehabilitation plan and vote your heart. Uh, I have not reviewed it at this point. I don't have any advocacy. Uh, as I remember, there was a short-term payout and a long-term payout option um, that were very technically different that I did not completely understand and would have to review again to summarize for you. So maybe you'll get that next time. But uh, take heart, fellow millionaires. We're going to get our money back. And be Mount Gox millionaires. It's the dream. Alrighty then. I guess we are wrapped up and it is final thoughts time. We didn't even mention Pizza Day. Hey, Pop, you never answered me. Is Bitcoin Pizza hiring delivery drivers? I had a good time on Bitcoin Pizza Day. Uh, there was a meetup around here, went down there, talked uh, a lot of lightning, a lot of tech amongst uh, some participants. Had a good time. I think people were there for like six hours plus. It was a good day. Nice and overcast. Nobody got a sunburn too bad. It's good stuff. You're My final thought is that on May 17th, I believe, it was the four-year anniversary of Chelsea Manning being released from prison. My final thought. We're not going up until Tina cries. <laughs> so tomorrow <laughs> in I hear a few was, hours there was some fun there there was like there was waifu price predictions on the table in that one so uh, maybe we'll have to get him on here to comment on it one of these days but yeah um, brace yourselves punks this is the season finale there will be no digest except maybe random things for two weeks or so. Um, yeah. Up forever, punks. Up forever. Hold. 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 Respect existence or expect resistance. Up forever. <laughs> Was there